Don't sit down yet. Don't sit down. Peace of the Lord be with you. Take a moment and share the peace of Christ and share what you did over break with whoever you share the peace with. Share, 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 share. I had a great break. It was good. It was good. It was good. All right, all right, all right. All right. So who went on an athletic trip someplace? Little, okay, some athletes out there. Anyone go on an immersion trip? All right. Anyone just go someplace with their friends? Yeah, yeah. Um, anyone just, you know, like said, I am going to have a staycation. I'm just going to stay here. Anyone do that? Yeah, all right. The hardcore. You were in the library every day. You got up at like 6 a.m. and went to the weight room. I know, I know. I had a great break. Um, I missed you while I was gone. I thought about you. Uh, but while I was gone, I, I went to New York uh, to see a friend and preached in a church, in a little white clapboard church, and got to bring greetings to you. Do you know that like, people are really curious about you? They want to know, like, what are Hope College students like? And I say to them, oh, they're beautiful. They're amazing, the most intelligent people you will ever meet. I came back and I was home for a day and then I got on a plane and went down to North Carolina for a self-imposed hiking and conversation retreat with one of my best friends, T. Gatewood. We hiked Grandfather Mountain, which is right outside of Boone in a little town called Banner Elk. And T's one of those friends in my life that I go to when I just need to kind of like figure some things out when I need to be really honest. He's a great listener. He's a great friend. And so I just had some time in the Gatewood kitchen talking, eating, thinking, hiking, praying. It was great. Ended up at a uh, worship conference with Bruce Benedict uh, at Duke Divinity and then came back home on Saturday. And I got home just in time for one of my favorite things in the world, you know, I'm at that age, I'm middle age in a minivan, uh, and I'm, you're in a minivan because you got little ones. And uh, it, it, it's amazing. But when I'm gone on a trip like that, what I miss the most are, are my kids, my little ones. And so I was able to get back home just in time for bedtime. Uh, well, at least one of them. Ella, our daughter, was already down, but Trigvi was still up. He stayed up so that I could read to him the Lord of the Rings. We're in the two towers now, and he just got introduced to Treebeard. It's fantastic. Um, I want to be Treebeard when I grow up, these deep, deep roots and this deep, abiding patience and a wisdom that transcends age. Trigvi just got introduced to Treebeard, and after we read... He brushes his teeth and puts on his PJs. He gets into bed. And then it's time for us to pray. And I usually make the sign of the cross and I do the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace as you rest tonight. And then I I ask him, "What, what would you like to be prayed for? And he looked me in the eye and then he turned away. And he said, I don't want to pray anymore. I don't want to pray anymore, Daddy. Before I tell you more about why he doesn't want to pray, let's take a step back and get reoriented. We're coming back from spring break. Everyone's been someplace or in this place, but we're regrouping for this final stretch, this four to five weeks before the season is finished. For some of you, it's your freshman year. For some of you, it's your senior year, and you're getting ready for what's next. But right now, we got to get our minds together for this final stretch of our life together. And what we've been doing is preparing ourselves to enter into the life of Jesus during Lent. Lent, that season, that six weeks, that 40 days of traveling with Jesus towards Calvary, towards the cross, and inching our way to the glory of Easter Sunday. This is week five. Next week begins Palm Sunday, and we head into 
the most consequential week in the history of humanity. We have been walking slowly, step by step. And as we get back together and we tell the stories of spring break, it's important that we get our mind right as we are on this consequential journey with Jesus. And as we've been journeying with Jesus, we've had some help. We've had this artist, Wilhelm Otto Dix. Wilhelm Otto Dix, this is a part of a series that's at the, uh, the Kreisinger Art Museum. Uh, uh, Otto Dix is widely considered one of the most important 20th century artists in Germany. He was leader of the Warheim, uh, or it was a reaction to the Warheim Society, Germany from 1918 to 1933. His work of art is a reaction against the Expressionism movement. In other words, he was troubled by the self-indulgence and the romantic nature of some of the art that was being produced at a time in his country when the harsh realities of war persecution, alienation was going on. And so he wanted to start a movement where his work of art would have a harsh realism. In the 1960s, he did did 33 paintings that are all in the Cam Art Museum, sketches, I should say, charcoal sketches, on the Gospel of Matthew. This is the image of the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus praying. It's a sketch based on these words from Matthew 26, verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he brought with him Peter and the sons of Zebedee, And he became grieved and agitated. And then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even unto death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And then going a little farther, he fell to the ground, praying, praying, praying. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Jesus, we see in Dix's image. What do we see here? It's important that we see what Otto wants us to see. It's important that we see what the word of God wants us to see. We see Jesus. And he's afraid. He's scared. There's evil looming over the top of him. He can sense it. It's like a palpable spirit. The lines are as sharp as a blade, ready to draw blood. And we see Jesus here, not as a cosmic superhero, Not as a moral Buddha ready to just dispense information on how to become a better you. Jesus here is not an impassable God. This is Jesus, scared. This is Jesus, the Son of God, the Lion of Heaven, preparing to be the Lamb of God. And he's terrified. What the scriptures reveal here and what Dix wants us to see is that Jesus is a human being just like you, just like me. This is Jesus scared. God taking on human flesh enters into our life and human experience in the same experience you and I have. Jesus is scared. And what does Jesus do when he's scared? What does Jesus do when he's terrified? What does Jesus do when he doesn't know what to do? He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He takes a couple friends. And then he prays. He prays. That's an important thing to just observe about Jesus. Jesus prays. 
Eugene Peterson says it this way. The most important thing to know about prayer is that Jesus is praying right now and for you. The large revealed fact that Jesus is praying is the reality in which you and I learn to do our prayers. My life of prayer primarily is not about what I do or don't do, but what Jesus is doing right now, interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. In other words, one of the most consequential works that's happening in the world right now is prayer. And the prayer that defines the world is Jesus praying. This same Jesus that is depicted here is the same Jesus that is at the right hand of God praying for us right now. Jesus prays. When Jesus doesn't know what to do, he prays. When Jesus is scared, he prays. When Jesus is terrified, he prays. And how does he pray? Father, It's intimate. It's personal. It's not a metaphor. It's not just an idea. He's praying to his Father in heaven. Which is why in the church we use the word Father, because that's the words Jesus used in pray. And when the way Jesus prays informs how we pray, Jesus prays to his Father. And this is one of the most touching and moving and hard to understand scriptures in the Bible for me. The Son, Jesus, the Son, is praying to the Father. And he offers a prayer that I think is instructive. He offers a prayer that if we take seriously can lead us into a whole different kind of life. It is a prayer that is hard to pray. It is a prayer that is nearly impossible to master. But it is a prayer that if we make part of our daily life, will invite us to participate in the very large work of God. Jesus prays this simply. Jesus falls to the ground. It says that he is grieved even unto death. Have you ever felt that way? kind of panic, that kind of anxiety, and you just fall to the ground. You don't know what else to do. Physically, he lays on the ground and he prays, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. There are two important things that we need to observe in this prayer. The first is that Jesus is praying to change God's mind. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. This is code for saying, Jesus, take away the cross. Take away my death. If it's possible, can you find some other way to achieve this goal? If it's possible, I don't want to suffer. Father, if it's possible, I don't want to die. Father, will you stop this? Will you not let this happen to me? He falls down, grieved unto death. Father, please, please, please stop this. Jesus wants to change God's mind. There's precedence for this. Moses pleaded to God to change God's mind, and God changed his mind. This same Jesus said Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Right? Prayer is an invitation that maybe, just maybe, we can get what we want from God. But it doesn't always happen, does it? If we're honest. We don't always get what we ask for in prayer. And that's a hard medicine to swallow. I sat down with Trigvi after reading Lord of the Rings and learning about Treebeard, and I knelt by his bed, put my hand through his sandy hair, and it's time to pray, and he turns away. Daddy, I don't want to pray. Why don't you want to pray, Trig? There's a long pause, and he said, because when I pray, God doesn't answer me. He's seven. 
but he gets it. He's seven, my budding theologian. And he's asking the right question. He doesn't even know that it's a question, but he gets that there's a dissonance, that some of the things that he's asking for are not happening the way he wants them, the way he expects them to. I've asked and I I didn't receive, so I just want to stop praying. How do you pray when we don't get the answers that we want? Well, a couple things start to happen. Sometimes, like my son, you can just have the instinct that I should stop praying. Because if you're praying and God doesn't answer, maybe it means that God isn't real. Maybe it means that this isn't actually true, any of this. Have you ever had that thought? Has that ever crossed your mind that maybe what we're doing in here is it's not real? It's possible. That is an answer. Or maybe God is real, maybe God is there, but even worse than him not being real is that you pray and God just doesn't care. Maybe God is absent. God is indifferent. You pray, you plead with God about really important things like life and death. And you don't get the answer that you want. It could be that God isn't real. It could be that God is real and he just isn't listening anymore. Maybe you've had that situation Maybe for your parents in a divorce. Maybe in your own relationships, things aren't going the way you want and you've pleaded to God. Maybe it's as something as simple as an internship or a direction that you're going, but you have been pleading to God and God doesn't seem to answer. And how do you pray when God doesn't answer the way you want? It's easy to put up these little bricks of grudges with God. Use prayer as a means to test God. Are you real? If you're real, are you listening? Do you care? Jesus prays to change God's mind. And what is amazing about this passage is that God is silent. What's disturbing and unsettling to me is that the Son is pleading to the Father for his life and he doesn't get the answer that he wants. But then Jesus continues with the prayer. How do we pray when we don't know how to pray? Jesus concludes his prayer simply with this. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours, God, be done. Not me, but you. And this is the prayer, my friends. This is the prayer that if you can take into your life and pray and mean it, will change everything. Because everything in your life, everything in your culture suggests that you pray me, not you, God. Do you see what's happening here in the Garden of Gethsemane? Jesus is reversing the curse that had happened in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, where there was shalom, where everything was knit together with truth and beauty and goodness, where God and humanity and creation and even their very selves were intertwined in a wholeness and a purity, it all got shattered when we began to pray, not you, God, but me. But here in the Garden of Gethsemane, here in this garden, Jesus pleads to the Father. Please take this cup from me, but Lord, not my will, but yours be done. This is the prayer that reverses the curse of the garden. This is the prayer that Jesus teaches us that there is another kind of way, there's another kind of will. The big obstacle to the Christian faith are not intellectual ones. The big obstacles to the Christian faith, to Christ, to following him, to taking up his cross, is the will. Do we have the will to accept God's will and not our own? even when we don't understand it, even when it's confusing, maybe especially 
when it's confusing? Can we be faithful in following Jesus when we're praying and we don't get the prayers that we want? What do I say to my son who's praying but not getting the answers he wants from God? This is an important moment as a dad. And all I can say to him is, son, that is the right question. And the honest answer is, Trigvi, I don't know. I don't know why God doesn't always answer your prayers or my prayers. I don't always know why things they are the way they are. I don't always know why God allows the evil, the sun to rise on the evil and on the good. I don't understand sometimes, Trigvi, where, why God isn't acting. But I do know, son, that there's a difference. There's a difference between God not giving you what you want when you want it and him not listening to you. In other words, from, I didn't say this to him at bedtime, but I'll say it to you because you're smart people. There's a difference between the hiddenness of God and the absence of God. Because God is silent does not mean that God is absent. It just means that his will might be hidden from us. And so I said to my son, I don't always know why that happens, but I do know that we need to keep praying. We need to keep praying every day because Jesus teaches us in prayer that the most important thing with our prayer isn't, isn't to respond with God isn't there. It's not to respond with a kind of God is absent. It's to respond with a radical trust that God, we can trust your will even when it doesn't make sense. Trigvi, I don't know why God isn't there, but I, I'm choosing to trust. And so we're gonna keep praying. You can't pray tonight, but Trigvi, let me pray for you. And you may not be able to pray tonight, but let me pray for you. Let me pray that you can take Jesus' prayer and put it as a seed in the soil of your soul and it can be nurtured and it can grow. Take this prayer into your relationships. Take it into the classroom. Take it back to the dorm. Take it into possibly a future marriage or job or whatever God is calling you to do. Pray in this way. Lord, not my will but yours be done. Pray with a kind of trust that suggests even when it doesn't make sense, you will trust God's goodness. That's the Jesus prayer. That's what Jesus teaches us to do. I don't always know why God doesn't answer us, but I do know that he teaches us to pray, not my will, but yours be done. And so I pray for my son, and I pray for you. Lord, your ways are mysterious to us. And sometimes we're confused and even hurt because life isn't going the way we want it to. Circumstances seem out of our control, and God, we have cried to you, but we don't get the answer we want. But Lord, we are trusting that you hear us. We are trusting that your will is for this world you so loved. So come, Lord Jesus, and teach us, not our will, but yours be done. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and everyone said, amen.